for the first time in 2013, and we're live. I don't know why, but my students really like that. So if you're watching this online, whatever. Half-Life. So we've been talking about elements decaying, radioactive elements changing, nuclei changing, neutrons splitting up, protons forming out of neutrons splitting up, elements changing. So radioisotopes, the radioactive isotopes of the various elements, decay, forming new elements. That's what you're finding out in today's homework on the back of the first page when you were balancing those radioaction, radioactivity equations. You were saying, oh, I'm starting out with actinium and I'm ending up with something else. Um, here is the key. Different radioisotopes decay at different rates. Some decay very, very quickly, and some decay very slowly. Some take a long time to decay, some very, very fast. In fact, the ones on the very, very bottom on that periodic table behind you in gray, those are so fast we can only create them in labs for split seconds. And they've already decayed into two new elements. The way we describe the time it takes to decay, we use a term called the half-life. How about since I did two blanks, I use the two blanks. Half-life or not. We'd find the half-life of each radioisotope. Isotope. This is how long it takes for half of the element to decay. In other words, if you started with one kilogram and it was decaying, 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 once you had 500 grams, half a kilogram left time, that length of time is the half-life. This is the time that it takes for one half or 50%. So if you decay faster, that means you have a much shorter half-life. Again, the ones in gray on the bottom of that periodic table at the back of the room, they have half-lifes measured in thousandths and hundredths and millionths and trillionths of seconds. They decay really fast. Uh, there are elements that have half-lifes that are measured in billions of years. They decay really slowly. Uh, a very famous one is carbon-14. You may have heard of carbon-14 dating. This is how we can figure out how old objects are as long as they were biological, once-living organisms. So carbon-14 is the radioisotope isotope of carbon. Most of the time, carbon has a mass of 12. I think it's what it is on your periodic table, yes? Sarah, you got your periodic table in front of you? What's the atomic mass of carbon? Is it 12? Yeah. Yep. Ah, but every once in a while, there are some forms of carbon. They got two extra neutron, neutrons. Those will decay. So when you're alive, organisms, anything living, plants, us, animals, trees, we take in and we lose carbon. And Hayden, as long as you're taking in and losing carbon, that means that you keep the same ratio in your body of carbon-12, the stable isotope, to carbon-14. You have barely any carbon-14 in your body, Hayden, but you have some. However, sorry to get depressing on you, when you die, you stop taking in new carbon, and so all of the carbon-14 left in your body starts to decay. And since you're not replacing it with any new carbon-14, you get, as time progresses, less and less and less and less and less carbon-14 in your body. If we measure how much carbon-14 you have in your body compared to the carbon-12, we can figure out how old you must have been when you died, whether it's a person, 
or a tree or anything made up of stuff that was once living. So, when an organized organism dies, it no longer takes in new carbon, but the carbon-14 decays to carbon-12. So the longer something has been dead, the less carbon-14 there is. This can be used to measure how old something is. This is how they figured out, for example, how old King Tut was when he lived. Sorry, when he died. And we can be reasonably accurate. There is always some error in our measurements, but we can be fairly close. And carbon-14 isn't the only one that we can use. There's all sorts of elements, especially elements that aren't taken in by living creatures, that we can use to figure out, for example, how old the Earth is. So there's my King Tut photo. You have it on your screen. What, you need that? You good? Yeah. Right, faster. Okay. You got you on the page now? Yeah. You sure? Yeah? You sure? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Using a decay curve. We're going to have to do some math in our heads, but it's dividing by two, so I'm hopeful we can handle it. Why is it dividing by two? Half-life. Suppose you have, and I'm going to pick a nice number that lots of stuff goes in, 12 grams of a particular radioactive substance. We'll call it schusterinium, a new element. We've just found it on the periodic table. And it has a half-life of 10 years. What does that mean? That means as schusterinium decays, after 10 years, if you start with 12 grams, how much is left? Six grams. Or if I wanted to give it as a percent, what percent? 50%. After another 10 years, so 20 years in total, or two half-lives, how much true sterenium would be left? Three. Uh, what percent is, is this? I'll give you a hint. It's half of 50. 25%. How much would you have 10 years later? 1.5 grams, which would be half of 25%, I think 12.5%. How much would you have 10 years later? Half of 1.5. How much would you have after? Half of that, half of that, half of that, half of that, half of that. To determine how much is left, all you do is you multiply the original mass or the original percentage or the original amount by a half or on your calculator 0.5 for each half-life that has passed. And you get what's called a decay curve. Now, this is the decay curve for carbon-14. Unlike schusterinium, which has a very nice half-life of 10 years, sadly, most elements don't pick nice numbers for us. Carbon-14 has a half-life of, can you figure it out from the graph? It's on the graph there. We labeled it as a point. You see it? Can you read it on yours? Is it a good enough copy? I hope it is. It's a bit blurry. Is it a bit blurry? Okay, up here you can kind of see it. Uh, it's got a half-life of 5,730 years. Every 5,730 years, you've lost about half of your carbon-14. So if you started out with 100% right here, you can make a graph at time zero when the person or the tree, or the object died, they were good. They had 100% of their carbon-14. After 5,730 years, you can see we have 50%. After another 5,730 years, which makes 11,460, we have 25%. After another half-life, we have half of 25, 12.5% or one eighth left. Then one sixteenth left, a half times a half times a half times a half. You get this very famous to math nerds decay curve. This is a radioactive decay curve. They look like that. And you're gonna generate your own next class. 
Practice problems, page 306. Can you turn your textbooks, please, to page 306, under the B, 3, under the I, O, uh, O, under the N, 6. Page 306. Okay. There's a clearer copy of the decay curve on page 306 for carbon-14. That one you guys can read, yes? Okay. So, we're just going to answer the questions out loud. Number one says, what's the length of one half-life of carbon-14? Can you see it from the graph now? 5,730. Depends on the element. Some elements have half-lives. There's uh, one element has a half-life of 23 billion years. Its half-life is longer than the age of the universe. And again, there are some elements that have half-lives that are quicker than a blink. Uh, how many half-lives have passed when there's one quarter of the original amount remaining? That's how many years. How many half-lives? Two. How can you figure that out? What's the bottom number of the fraction? Four. How many times does two go into it? Two. Okay says, estimate the percentage of carbon-14 remaining after 5,000 years. So after 5,000 years, if I look at this graph, I'm kind of estimating. Here's 5,000, right about there. Read back here. I would guess around 55%-ish, halfway between 50 and 60. Could be 56, could be 54. Ah, I'm estimating. Uh, what about 10,000 years? So here's 10, where's 10,000 years? There's 5,000, 1, 2, 3, 4, 10,000 years is right here. Yoink. About 30%-ish, give or take. What percent after 20,000 years? There's 20,000 years. Looks like it's just below 10%. I would guess maybe or 9%. That's why I said to you there's some roughness in these measurements, but we can be close. We can be close. Uh, number four says, estimate the time elapsed when the amount of carbon-14 remaining is 70%. Okay, here's 70%. Read across, drop down. How many years have elapsed when you have 70% of your carbon-14 remaining? Sorry? It looks like about 3,000. I almost, mine looks like maybe a tiny bit more than 3,000, like maybe 3,100, but yeah, 3,000 ish. See that okay, Dane? Across and then drop down? Yeah, I see that. Yep. Uh, 40%. -na 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 right there and drop down. I got to count. One, two, three, four, five, six. I lost it. 40, drop down. Are you getting around seven and a half thousand? It looks like it's between seven and eight, yeah? So if you said 7,400 justice and you said 7,600, I'd take it. I would usually just split the difference. It's about 7,500. Uh, 5%. Woo. Looks like around 30,000 years. Will this ever get to zero? Actually, theoretically, no, because you can keep dividing by a half and dividing by a half and dividing by a half and dividing by a half. You'll get closer and closer and closer and closer to zero, but in theory, never quite will. There should always be some that's detectable. You may reach the point, Josh, where there's so little carbon-14, we can't detect it, but there's still some there. Okay. Turn the page. <coughs> we will pick up with this on Friday. So your homework is finish the uh, sheet that I gave out today. That's due for Friday. Mm -hmm.